As you watch this video, you may feel a little confused about some of the language. You will hear building biologist Oram Miller refer to technicalities like milliwatts, milligauss, and microteslas. Don't let the technical language bother you. You don't need to become a physicist to read your scanning meters. In the video, we show you close-ups of the meter display so you'll know what the harmful exposures look like on the meter. And Orem will tell you about the important readings, so all you need to do when you're using the meter is pay attention to what mode you're in and what the reading number is and compare that to the readings you saw in the video. You might want to make a few notes from these demonstration videos for quick reference for later when you are using the meter to scan your spaces. It's never a bad idea to learn more about the science behind electromagnetic frequencies, and we refer to some of that in the videos, but we have designed our videos to be useful and comprehensible whether or not you are technically inclined. Hello, my name is Oram Miller, Certified Building Biology Environmental Consultant based in Los Angeles, California. And we're here to show you the use of several of the meters that are available at emfhelpcenter.com. These are affordable meters that will help you to measure electromagnetic fields in your home. Um, and this meter here is the Cornet uh, ED78S electrosmog meter, which actually has two functions, and it measures two different EMFs. The first is extra low frequency magnetic fields at 60 cycles, uh, which uh, is the magnetic field of house wiring. And the other EMF that it measures is radio frequencies. There are four types of EMFs that the building biology profession recognizes. The first is magnetic fields at 60 cycles per second. The second is electric fields at 60 cycles per second from house wiring. The third is radio frequencies, and the fourth is dirty electricity. And we have meters available at uh, emfhelpcenter.com that you can purchase to measure all four of those. And we'll be going over that with you uh, on these videos. So the four types of EMFs that I just mentioned each have their own effect on human health. Uh, the electric fields and magnetic fields from house wiring have a certain effect. Radio frequencies have another effect, and dirty electricity, uh, a fourth type. They're all measured with different meters or with a combined meter on different settings. And you need different meters or, again, a combined meter with, at different settings to measure each one of these. So on the Cornet ED78S uh, electrosmog meter, the way you operate it is you press the power button that turns it on, and the first type of EMF that it um, starts to read by default is radio frequencies. If you want to read magnetic fields, you press the top black button, and then it will start to read magnetic fields at one setting. And if you press it a second time, then it's a more refined setting. So you can toggle through these three types of EMFs by pressing this top button. Now, you'll notice that you have uh, a number that appears on the screen, and to the uh, right of that, you have a histogram. And this is a running uh, indicator on a bar graph here of what the reading is and has been historically over the past minute or two. And you'll notice that in terms of how high the, uh, the bars go. So that's one way that you can tell uh, what the how the readings change uh, as you measure them. Now you also have a hold feature here by pressing the second button. And when you press that, then it holds the reading that you just had. Uh, and also if you take it off hold and let it run, you'll notice that you have a max reading on the bottom, and that actually is the last highest number that this meter reads. This meter measures radio frequencies in milliwatts per meter squared, which is small m, big W, milliwatts per meter squared. Now, the safe level, according to the building biology profession and many other um, uh, authorities and experts around the world is that you be below 100 uh, microwatts per meter squared or 10 microwatts per meter squared in the sleeping area. So what that translates to here on this meter is 0 0.1 milliwatts per meter squared in general, in daytime, for healthy people, and at night below 0 0.01 milliwatts, milliwatts per meter squared. That would be ideal in your sleeping area. Don't forget that you also have an LED indicator on the right here, uh, which goes from two green levels to three yellows and up to the red. So if you're moving this around and you can't read the number, 
but you see that you're up in the upper yellow or red, then you know that you have a high level, and then you can look down and see what the actual number is. So the safe level for magnetic fields with this meter would be 0.1 UT, or 0.1 microtesla, which happens to equal one milligauss. And you can always see that conversion between what you read with the big numbers and the milligauss in parentheses beneath it. So the other tool that we use to measure magnetic fields is effectively called the buzz stick, and it's comprised of a mini amplifier speaker and a uh, telephone input that is used for the hard of hearing with a suction cup at the upper end here and a magnetic coil inside of it that's put on the back side of a, a telephone handset. And what we do is we um, plug that into the input jack of the mini amplifier speaker and this whole apparatus minus the stick is available from emfhelpcenter.com. So the way we use this is to turn this on and then we put the pickup in any direction that we're trying to assess whether magnetic fields are present or not. So for instance, if I put this near uh, the lamp up above that is on a dimmer, we actually can pick up an increase in the noise because of the magnetic field harmonics from the dirty electricity, but that's another topic. So in terms of magnetic fields, I want to show you uh, an example of one of the types of magnetic fields that I mentioned before, and that would be transformers. So remember, a point source can be either a transformer or a, an electric motor. In this case, we have 120 volts in this outlet, and we have uh, the transformer stepping that down to low voltage, which goes on these wires to uh, a cordless telephone, or to, in this case, the charger for a cell phone. So this transformer, they actually work by creating magnetic fields. So we're going to turn on the buzz stick, and we're going to put the input of that next to the transformer, so you can, you can actually hear where the field is and how far it extends. Now let's say that you have a wall here, and this is your bed, and your, your pillow is right here, and you want to know whether you have any magnetic fields where you sleep, but you don't know what's behind that wall. So you can actually use the buzz stick and just run it across the wall or along the floor, and you go past that noise, and you have localized the sound. So you go past, and there it is. So then what you do is you get your gauss meter out and turn it on to the magnetic field setting. And now what we're going to do is put this up against this transformer and you see how the LEDs go up into the red on the LF30 setting and it says O period L period. That means over, le over limit. That means that we're too high to measure the magnetic fields in this setting. So what we need to do then is press this top button, not once, because that puts you back into the radio frequency setting, but twice to put you back in the coarse magnetic field setting. And now you move the Gauss meter towards the transformer and we're measuring uh, as high as uh, 29 to 34 microtesla. Now that's actually 290 to 300 milligauss, which is way too high. However, as you move this back just one foot, it goes down to 0.1 microtesla, and remember I told you that that's equivalent to one milligauss, and that's safe. So from here on out, you're actually um, in the safe zone. So the way that you use this Gauss meter with a point source uh, magnetic field, uh, of magnetic field exposure like a transformer, is you find the presence of the transformer, and you see here that you're in the red in the LED, and the number is very, very high, so you start to then pull it back slowly until you get to the point where you're at 0.1 microtesla, which is the big number on the top. And at that point, which is right here, this is your safe zone. So you measure this out and you just don't sit or sleep in this area. If this is on the other side of the wall, you don't have any control over it, so you have to move your bed to get away from that. But in your home, you could move things around so that you're out of that field. That's how we work with um, point source magnetic fields. So in a typical kitchen, you're going to find several sources of magnetic field exposure from transformers and from motors. So a motor would include a blender or um, some other appliance that's on your kitchen counter. But in terms of transformers, you have them all over the kitchen. For instance, in a microwave oven, you have the transformer here behind this, uh, this control board and a digital clock. 
And the purpose again of the transformer is to take 120 volts and step it down to the low voltage needed by this circuit board and the liquid crystal display clock. So you can verify that again by the presence of the buzzing with the with the buzz stick. And there's the transformer right there because that's that's where the sound is loudest. And then we can also verify that with the gauss meter. So again, all we do is we press this up against the the um, oven and you see the red LED and the level is very high. But again, you notice it's 45. It's actually uh, over the limit, which is uh, several hundred um, uh, of micro Tesla. And then we pull it out and all we have to do is go to one foot and we're down. Well, still at 10 milligauss here. So then we pull it back and the safe level here is this distance, about two feet away from this. Now, there are clients that I have who are electrically hypersensitive. They don't use the microwave and they don't want this magnetic field filling this area because they might be here working at the counter doing some food prep. So what they do is they go into the cabinet up here and pull the plug out of the wall for the microwave, which actually in this case happens to be back here. And this goes away. So when this is off, there's no magnetic field from this. One thing you particularly want to pay attention to in a kitchen is the location of the controls for your stove or your electric range. Even if you have a gas stove, you could have the controls right here, and that can include a clock, an LCD digital clock, and again, you know that that means that there's a transformer behind there. So there are many stoves that I've seen that have the uh, controls and the clock right here, and if that's the case, there will be a magnetic field that com literally comes out this far, and it's very strong this close. But what does the average uh, a person do, uh, particularly a mom, for instance, who may be pregnant, who's standing right here doing the cooking, and she has a very strong magnetic field right on her abdomen. In this case, we have a gas range with the controls in the front, but there's no clock here. There's no digital control. So we can take our buzz stick, and we can move it across the front, and there's really no difference in the level of sound that we hear in this location from anywhere else around it, and more importantly, or most, import, most importantly, we can take our gauss meter and we see what the level of magnetic field is. Let's put it on the LF30 scale. And it's 0 0.04, which is a nice low number. It's less than 0.1, which is our safe level. Uh, and you can move it here and you get no increase in the magnetic field level. The LED indicator stays the same color. The number on the screen doesn't move. So there's no clock here. There's no uh, transformer in this location. So this is considered a safe stove. If you do want to buy a new stove, make sure the clock is in the back and the controls should be back here or they can be on the side, but there should be no controls and no clock right in the front of the stove. So this is the back side of the refrigerator, which is right on the other side of this wall in the kitchen. And you can hear where the motor is. Right here. And if you put the gauss meter, which measures out here a nice 0.02 to 0.06 uh, micro Tesla, which is 0.2 to, to 0.6 milligauss, which is acceptable. But when you move this down here, you see that the little LED lights go into the red, and we have a reading. Oh, it's overload. Oh, my goodness. All right, so that is above, one, above 10 milligauss. But it does drop away as you move away. So here, we're down to one milligauss at about a foot and a half away. So that's the characteristic of a point source motor, an electric motor. The magnetic field is very strong close in, but it drops off exponentially so that even though it was 10 milligauss, or higher than that actually at the wall, but about 12 to, uh, to uh, 16 inches away, it dropped down to one milligauss. So it's a quick decline in terms of the uh, reduction in the, in the strength of the magnetic field from a point source, like an electric motor. So when you're looking for magnetic fields in a house, these are the fields that you're going to be looking for, possibly from point sources, which we've already reviewed in the kitchen, that's transformers and electric motors. The next one would be current on the grounding system, and that would be due to uh, current on the water service supply pipe, 
or uh, possibly the incoming TV cable, the sheathing of that. Then the next source would be wiring errors, where you have an incorrect wiring of circuits in your uh, junction boxes throughout the house. And the fourth cause of magnetic fields in homes would be uh, power lines that are outside the house, either overhead or underground. Now, if that's the case, what you're going to find with the Gauss meter is that you're going to see the same number, the same level, virtually everywhere you go in the house. Up, down, left, right, uh, high, low, uh, front, back. You're always going to find the same number, and it's not going to change throughout that room very much at all. In fact, it only gradually changes as you go from the back of the house to the front of the house. So let's say that it actually does begin to go up very slowly as you move towards the front of the house. And that will be true for every room in the front of the house relative to every room in the back. Well, then you look out the front window and there's the power line, or buried if it's not overhead. And if you go out the front door, you're going to see that the number doesn't decrease, as would be the case with magnetic fields that are from inside the house. You walk out that front door towards that power line and the number just continues to gradually go up. So that's your clue there. Now in this house, we actually don't have that situation, so we can't show that to you. <clears throat> we also don't have wiring errors, but we do have uh, one of the other possible sources. So we take the buzz stick and we turn it on and we just do a sweep along the floor, for instance, and there's a sound. And we notice that that sound is only located in one place or in one line. And in fact, it's strong here, but as we move this way, the sound goes down. But as we move this way, the sound goes up. So this is actually taking a diagonal path. And what you can't see behind the camera is the fact that the breaker panel is right outside that door. So I suspect that this is due to current on uh, the water pipe or the grounding system connected to the water pipe. And we can verify that with our Gauss meter. So we turn it on. And again, we press the top button because we're not interested in radio frequencies at this moment. So we press the button and go to the uh, magnetic field setting. And we go past the first one to the second one. So now we're on the LF30 setting. And we put this down towards the floor. And what we notice is that the number goes up when we get right over that path. It's in the red, and so we are now in, in excess of our safe level of one milligauss. So what we need to do is to go outside and see if there is, in fact, current on the water pipe that's out front. So this is the source of the magnetic field that we found inside the house. It's electric current flowing on the metal water service supply pipe under this yard which is connected to the metal water main at the street, which is to which is, uh, is connected the metal water pipes of every house up and down the street. And to verify that, we're going to take our Gauss meter and buzz stick and verify this on the pipe right here. So when I turn on the buzz stick and put the stick against the pipe, here we go. And you can hear that noise and it's present all the way along this pipe as it goes in the house. And we can also take the Gauss meter and we can put the Gauss meter on the water pipe and it goes up to 6.4 microtesla, which is 64 milligauss. And then it drops down to a background level of 2 milligauss here, or 0.2 microtesla. So we're inside the front bedroom, right inside the entrance of that metal water pipe, which is right outside this window. And it comes in in the crawl space of this room right under here. And you can verify that with this buzz stick. So when, there, you hear that? And as I pass over the water pipe, the sound goes down. So here it is again. So the location is right there. And then if we move the buzz stick this way, we continue to get that noise. And we go back and forth. It's quiet. It's loud. It's quiet. And it's going all the way to the breaker panel on the back of the house. <clears throat> and now we can see what the magnetic field level is by putting the Gauss meter right over 
the location of that pipe. And the ambient level in the room up here is less than one milligauss. It would be uh, five tenths of a milligauss or 0.05 microtesla. But when I move the gauss meter down and lay it right on top of where that pipe is, it goes up to 0.9 or even 1.0 microtesla, which is 9 to 10 milligauss. So this is not a safe situation. We can get rid of this by having an electrician and a plumber come and put a dielectric union in to the water pipe that's out there and put an extra earth rod in. And there are certain procedures that need to be followed in order to do that properly, keep the house in code, and to uh, have it grounded properly according to code. So again, magnetic fields have four sources. Power lines outside, current on the water pipes and grounding system, point sources like transformers and motors, and wiring errors. So in this case, when you have a wiring error, you'll notice that when the buzz stick is on and you have the light switch off and you get your baseline uh, volume and you turn on the light, if you have a wiring error here, then you're going to have a large sound with your buzz stick. Now a wiring error is uh, the result of improper wiring by an electrician who didn't follow code and didn't connect the wires properly. The lights work, but you have a net current, a difference in the current between the hot going one way and the neutral coming back. And because of that difference, there's a net magnetic field. You don't have full cancellation of the magnetic fields between the two uh, wires, because one can carry three amps, the other one can carry two and a half. So that half amp difference creates a magnetic field that comes out into the room when the light is on. The other way that you can confirm that is with the presence of your core net electrosmog uh, detector. So you turn it on and you go past the radio frequency setting into the magnetic field settings. And if you put it into the LF30 setting and then you hold it even one or two feet away from the wall, if there's a wiring error in, uh, in that, on that circuit, you're going to have an exceedingly high magnetic field even several feet into the room. If that's the case, then you need to um, have the services of an electrician who knows what they're doing or contact a building biologist who can then instruct the electrician on how to find and fix this problem. Now we're going to measure the smart meter here. And we know that we have a smart meter because it's digital as opposed to the analog meter that people have had in the past for measuring electricity. That kind of meter has a rotating disc and, and little dials on the top with numbers. The smart meter is digital and you know that because it has a digital display for displaying the numbers. This happens to be an iTron brand, and you see that at the bottom, OpenWay is the model made by the iTron company, which is one of six manufacturers of smart meters in the United States and around the world. GE, Landis Gear, Elster, Echelon, and Census being the other five that I know of. Now, smart meters were first deployed in the US in uh, the Pacific Gas and Electric Service Area in Northern California. If they were not the first, they were one of the first. That was several years ago. And that's where all the controversy began because the smart meters put out what's called a beacon signal, which is broadcast uh, several times per minute all throughout the day and night, 24-7, for the smart meters to be synchronized and talk to each other, not so much for, not for transmitting data. That's done once or twice a day where there's a collection process from the level fives to the level four, three, two, to one. And then the one level one smart meter in a mesh network sends the data from 1,000 to 1,500 homes to uh, the central office. So different utilities have a different uh, a schedule of when the data is actually collected through the mesh network. However, at other times in the day and night, there is something called the beacon signal. It's the beacon signal and the uh, transmission of data once or twice a day that bothers people. And because the power density or the strength of the radio frequency signal from these devices, both for the data once or twice a day, but more importantly for the beacon signal, which is every minute, has been so strong and is so strong from the meters that are uh, used by Pacific Gas and Electric in Northern California, which are GE and Landis gear models. Because of that signal coming through the bedroom wall and into the house and from neighbors into the, uh, through the windows and into people's homes, uh, a number of people got sick. A word of caution about digital utility meters. They are making people sick. 
In many cases, the electromagnetic frequencies from these devices seem to negatively affect people more than cell phones, cordless phones, Wi-Fi, microwave ovens, cell phone towers, and other common wireless sources. Electromagnetic sensitivity is very selective in terms of frequencies, times of day, and other circumstances. We have received hundreds of reports of serious health issues with digital utility meters. Some utility companies attempt to disregard these health issues and point to obsolete and flawed FCC regulations as justification for the installations. Even if the FCC regulations were current and valid, the FCC has no jurisdiction to authorize installations of anything on private property without consent of the occupants and the property owners. The FCC does not regulate your property, and they cannot force you to accept anything on your property that you find to be a problem. It is your utility company that is attempting to make those decisions, and if they try to make you believe the FCC is forcing someone to do something, that is simply not true. Apart from that, some utility companies have inappropriate policies seeking to extract extortion fees from customers for the removal of harmful transmissions, referring to that as an opt-out of a harmful technology that nobody voluntarily opted into in the first place. Unfortunately, these opt-out arrangements still deploy digital metering with certain exposure hazards, and power companies have been known to remotely turn transmitters back on without the customer's knowledge, sometimes within hours, even when they are charged fees to keep them turned off. And of course, digital meters have data recorders, which are surveillance devices collecting very detailed databases of your private living habits inside your home for viewing and enjoyment by total strangers and hackers anywhere in the world. Digital meters, because of poor design and poor installation methods, have caused thousands of house fires. And the utility industry has yet to properly acknowledge this problem, much less fix it. For these reasons, EMF Help Center does not recommend accepting digital metering or the cost or terms of any so-called opt-out contracts, although by refusing that, you may find your utility company to be extremely unreasonable and difficult in their responses. There are ways to oppose and fight the imposition of the unsafe and unlawful digital metering, for instance, at freedomtaker.com. However, there are circumstances where the utility customer can find no other practical or immediate solution than to accept the questionable opt-out contract offered by the utility company. In this case, it is wise to measure the emissions from your digital meter at least once a week to assure that remote settings on the meter have not been changed by your utility company without your knowledge and consent. Utility companies have destroyed the trust they once had with the public, and from now on, we must be watchdogs over the wrongdoing our utility companies are committing. Now, in terms of measuring the uh, smart meter, we're going to use our uh, Cornet electrosmog meter. You turn it on, and we're using the radio frequency um, means of uh, measuring here, not the magnetic field. So it's the first one that shows up. And notice that on the back, it actually tells you where the receiving antenna is. So for the Gauss meter, for measuring magnetic fields, that's on this side right here. For the radio frequency sensor, it's here and it starts above the battery case and goes all the way up to the top. So you don't want to put your hand around that because you're going to block that signal from getting to the antenna and you won't be getting the numbers that you really should. So you should hold it here. That's what they recommend. So you're not blocking this antenna. So we turn it on and the first setting that comes up is the radio frequency setting. It says RF00 at the top and we're measuring in milliwatts per meter squared. So when you're measuring smart meters, you want to use the hold feature. And the hold feature allows you to see the highest number that this meter has read since you turned it on last. So you can keep your eye on that, and you also can enable the sound feature, and you can actually hear a click. That's, that tells you that this has sent out a beacon signal. Now, the number of beacon signals that we have permitted from the ITRON brand smart meters happens to be fewer, many, many times fewer, 
than the number of beacon signals permitted from the Landis Skeeter and GE models used in Northern California. So there are differences in terms of the number of beacon signals per beacon signals per uh, minute, and there are also differences between manu uh, brands of smart meter and manufacturers of smart meters in terms of the power density. So we're not going to see the same numbers, and I don't see the same numbers when I do evaluations of homes in Southern California, for example, as I s hear and see on the YouTube videos from people who are measuring with the same meters, uh, the uh, smart meters in Northern California. So there are differences. Now what you have to do is just stand here and listen for the click and watch the meter, and you can see uh, when the smart meter sends out its beacon signal. You generally want to stay about two to three feet away because this is a far field meter and the far field for the frequencies that are used here starts at about three feet roughly. Then you'll get an accurate number. So we're waiting for the smart meter to send out a beacon signal, which for itrons is generally two, three times a minute. Now, if you live in Southern California with the itron smart meters or you're in a part of the country or Canada where you have the itron smart meters, then you might wait uh, half a minute to a minute before you see one of these spikes uh, of the beacon signal. If you're in a part of the country that has a, a different brand of smart meter that has many more beacon signals per minute, you're not going to be waiting very long between the uh, beacon signals. Okay, we just got a high signal and I'm going to freeze this and show you with a close-up what we just saw. It went to 2,600 milliwatts per square meter. And you see a spike on the histogram, and you see the number 2.6 on the bottom level. For safe human occupancy, that number 2.6 should be 0.1 or lower. If the meter is near anyone's sleeping area, the reading should be even lower at 0.01. This is especially true for children, pregnant women, EMF-sensitive people, anyone who is in poor health, and anyone who in the past has suffered cancer, heart disease, or any neurological disorder. Any reading over one milliwatt per square meter means that portion of your property is not safe for occupancy. In this case, it is advisable to inform your utility company policy administrators in writing that the readings from their utility meter are above safe levels at, in this case, 2.6 milliwatts per square meter, and they must reduce the amplitude of these frequencies to under one milliwatt per square meter in order to be compliant with your property rights and to avoid unlawfully endangering the public health. So now we're going to measure the radio frequency exposure from this cordless phone base unit. This is the base unit and we know that because it has a telephone cord that goes from this unit to a telephone jack in the wall. And this is putting out radio frequencies 24-7. The charging cradles for the extension handsets that you have in other rooms do not put out radio frequencies when the call is not in progress. When you hang up the phone and you put the uh, handset in the other room into its charging cradle, there won't be any radio frequencies from that unit. However, in this room, we have radio frequencies coming from this base unit because it, that's what it is. It is the base unit for the whole network. So we turn on our electrosmog meter and we move it, uh, getting our hands away from the radio frequency antenna on this side, and we notice that we're getting several thousand uh, microwatts per meter squared or um, several milliwatts per meter squared. So I'm going to uh, freeze the uh, recording and press by pressing the hold button, the bottom one here, and what we see here now is that um, the histogram shows very high levels uh, uh, for the last um, half minute or so when the meter was near this cordless uh, phone base unit. And you also uh, notice that on the bottom line, which is the hold line, the maximum number uh, that we have on hold, the maximum number that we got to was six mic uh, milliwatts per meter squared or 6,000 microwatts, which is six times higher than the uh, extreme level as far as the building biology profession is concerned and um, even more than that. Uh, it, it's higher than the, the point 0.1 that we want to see on this meter in terms of safe levels. Now the other thing that I'd like to point out to you is if we take this base unit or this handset, I'm sorry, away from the base unit and I'll um, take this off of hold by pressing this button again and now the meter is running and now I'm going to move back 
more than five or six feet away from the base unit. And now I'm getting uh, in my target level of 0.1 or less uh, milliwatts per meter squared on the uh, meter. And the histogram is also uh, dropping as well. Now, what we notice is that when I turn this on, the number is going to go back up again because this is a, a 61 uh, milliwatts per meter squared because the radio frequency exposure from this is really high next to your head. So this is an extreme um, elevation of the number and I'm going to turn it off here and it's going to go back down. We're far away from the base unit but now this is putting out very high radio frequency levels right next to the head. When you measure radio frequencies from a laptop, we're talking about Wi-Fi, and bear in mind that the radio frequencies from a router are continuous. The Wi-Fi from a router is continuous. The Wi-Fi from a laptop is intermittent, so you're not going to see quite the same pattern uh, or uh, uh, readings from a laptop that you would with a router. Also bear in mind that if you want to protect yourself and reduce the radio frequency exposure that comes from a laptop, all you have to do is plug in an Ethernet cable, but there's one more thing you have to do. You have to turn off the Wi-Fi on the laptop manually, and that's relatively easy to do depending on what kind of computer you have. It doesn't just turn off when you plug in the Ethernet cable. Same thing with the router. You have to manually turn off the router's Wi-Fi. So let's measure the Wi-Fi from this laptop here. And I turn the power on for the electrosmog meter, and by default, it just automatically goes to the radio frequency setting. And just placing it here near the computer, I'm generating a histogram. Um, we see that the levels there, and I'm getting one to 3,000 microwatts per meter squared. So I'm going to freeze it by pressing the hold button once, this bottom button. And so uh, you can see the histogram uh, across there and the number on the hold line on the bottom there. Uh, so it's high. It's one to 3,000 uh, microwatts. It actually says 3.9. Uh, milliwatts per meter squared or 3,900 microwatts. That's way too high. So now what I want to do is take the hold off and unfreeze it and let it run again. And I'm going to continue to generate the histogram here with the high numbers. And then what I want to do is show you what happens when I turn off the Wi-Fi on this computer. So I'm going to do that and let it run a little bit more. And now we're getting numbers that are hundreds of times less so now I'm going to freeze it and show you that the histogram was high and then it, it went way low. And that shows you what happened when I turned the, the Wi-Fi off on the laptop. In the office, you can measure both magnetic and radio frequency EMFs with the Electrosmog Cornet meter. So let's first talk about magnetic fields and we'll turn this on and then we'll set it to LF30, and we're measuring in uh, microtesla now. Now the sources of magnetic fields that you'll have in an office are generally point sources, and that would come from transformers and motors. So certainly the hard drive motor of your computer will be a high source of magnetic fields close up. Now that drops off exponentially within a few inches, within a foot or so. But you, your leg or uh, foot or both can be in that field. So you want to take the um, electrosmog meter and then just put it near the computer, see what the level is, and then move it away. And you want to be uh, ideally below uh, 0 0.10 or less, which it is right now. Then another source of uh, magnetic field exposure could be uh, a heater, for instance, which we, you can't see it, but we have that under this desk. That's not a good idea to have within a few inches of your body because the magnetic field needs more than that to drop off. So I would move that heater over there, away from the location that it presently is in. A third and very common source of magnetic field exposure uh, at a desk is the power strip or surge protector that has a nest of transformers plugged into it each of which has a magnetic field that extends out generally a few inches, maybe a foot. Occasionally, one or two of them might come out two feet, and that's what the one you want to make uh, sure you don't have or guard against. So distance is your friend with all of these, mag uh, these EMFs, particularly magnetic fields. 
So if you notice with the electrosmog meter that you have high magnetic field readings over 0.1 microtesla, then you need to move the surge protector a couple of feet away in one direction or the other, and then you should be okay. Now when you're measuring radio frequencies in an office setting, then of course you want to uh, put your electrosmog meter into the uh, radio frequency setting, which is the first one that comes up when you turn it on. Now in this case, we have a situation where the numbers are going up and we're over two to 3,000 microwatts per meter squared, um, which is the same as two to four uh, milliwatts per meter squared sitting in this location. And the reason for that is the router over there that, is, uh, and that has Wi-Fi enabled. Now, in talking with the gentleman who uh, uses this uh, office, we, uh, this is what I customarily do with my clients, I went through with him uh, how this is arranged and what his needs are. So for instance, this is the modem, the router's over here, there's an ethernet cable that goes between them, that's normal, and that router has the capacity to bring internet service to a number of computers, which we have in this room, uh, in one of two ways either with a hardwired network through the ethernet cables that are plugged in, and that is in existence now. There are ethernet cables plugged into every device in this office. Um, uh, and then the other way is wirelessly through a wireless network. So he explained to me that he actually uh, uses this as his router for his house, which is just across the way there. Um, the problem with, uh, for when he's in there and when he has uh, friends over, the problem with that is when he's not in there and when his friends are not here, He's sitting here completely hardwired in his connections, and yet this thing is putting out very strong frequencies, much higher than what we consider to be safe, because it's not disabled. It's, it's enabled. It's just on in the background. Wi-Fi. It's Wi-Fi. Like an ashtray with four or five burning lit cigarettes filling this room with smoke, but you can't see or smell the smoke. But you know that it's there because you can see with the electrosmog meter in the radio frequency setting that uh, he has between... 600 uh, to 800 to 1400 um, microwatts per meter squared or 0.8, 1.4 milliwatts per uh, meter squared. And we consider in the building biology profession that one milliwatt per meter squared or 1000 microwatts per meter squared is an extreme biological risk in the sleeping area. So if you extrapolate that to the daytime situation, it, it's, it's still not healthy. So we would like to see people below 0.1 milliwatt per meter squared on the electrosmog meter, and we don't have that here. So what we can do is reconfigure this router so that um, he would be able to turn on and off the Wi-Fi. He can enable it and disable it through a computer that's connected with an Ethernet cable. Uh, and all you have to do is log in through the password, the username and password, and then you can go to the Wi-Fi uh, section, you can uh, save all that, bookmark it, and then with a couple of clicks on the computer you can enable the Wi-Fi or disable it, and then he can sit here and have access to the internet through the ethernet cables, but the Wi-Fi is off, and he'll be much more comfortable and much uh, healthier and safer. When you're measuring radio frequencies from a cell phone, you can do that with the Cornet electrosmog meter. Just bear in mind that the pattern of the radio signal transmission from a cell phone is intermittent. It's not going to be continuously high like would be the case from uh, a Wi-Fi enabled router or a cordless telephone base unit or even a cordless phone handset. So what I'm going to do here is turn the meter on by pressing the power button and as we've mentioned before it goes by default to the radio frequency setting and with the cell phone in airplane mode we have a low number of relatively four to five microwatts per meter squared or 0 0.004 milliwatts per meter squared on the Cornet meter. So now what I'm going to do is to take my cell phone out of airplane mode. So we do that. And not always, but sometimes, often times, the, when this connects to the tower, there it goes. Oh, wow, 166. This went up to 166 microwatts per meter squared. That's equivalent to 166,000 uh, microwatts per meter squared 
and this read 166 milliwatts per meter squared. The histogram is very high for those spikes, and then it's low, and then it's high again, and then it's low. So that's the pattern with uh, reading radio frequencies from a cell phone.